You've probably seen him on Facebook, probably on a videotape at home, probably somewhere. But many people are seeing him for the first time We have here. seen him in CNN. Okay, okay Bakasi. Bakasi. Um, I bring you greetings from home. Um, Nigeria is okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay with us. Yeah. Um, a few months ago, some of you were busy on social media advocating for change. Uh, that change has come. <laughs> Just that we are the ones feeling the impact at home. Uh, in some ways, some of you succeeded because now when you come home for holidays, your money has more value. Uh, but when we come here for vacation, ours have less value. Well, uh, a couple things caught my attention this evening. Uh, one of which is uh, the young, um, the young. Uh, girl who came up here who's a writer. Please, one more time, a round of applause. And I, I, I like the fact that, you know, in honoring her, you also did not forget about the parents who have made it possible. You know, uh, they say that if you want to hide information from black people, you put it in a book. You know, sometimes they tease us like that because uh, there, there's this assumption that we don't like to read. Yeah. So they say if you want to hide any information from black people, just put it in a book. It will just be there and they'll be staring at it. Um, but it's not completely true. Africa is a great continent. Uh, many good things started in Africa. Even writing. Even writing started in Africa. It started in Egypt. Civilization started in Africa. Great continent. Blessed. Nigerians are arguably some of the most educated immigrants in the world, statistics show. We're also a very rich country. Uh, at some point, we were the world's sixth largest producer of oil. You know, but Africa's biggest problem is uh, leadership. You know, you can't have everything. So in some parts of the world, God has punished with bad weather. Uh, maybe our own punishment is bad leadership. <laughs> you know, yeah. So we take it. We take it. But our people did well with oral tradition. Africa was an advanced society. Good system of government. Everything that it takes to be a superpower, Africa had. But we didn't manage it well, maybe. You know, so some people came with better intelligence, came into Africa as missionaries, handed us Bibles and destroyed idols, converted us from our traditional way of worship to Christians, and we welcomed them because Africans are very welcoming. But we did not know that they had slavery in mind. You know, so while we were busy welcoming them and acquiring a bit of their culture and religion, they were packing ships to take some people to come farm in this part of the world. But we were not prepared. So they took some of our ancestors, brought them this far, you know, and now that Africa is ready to travel, they don't want us to travel. They have embassies all over the place. <laughs> stopping people from getting visas. You took us when we were not ready, forced us into ships. Now we are ready to travel. You don't want us to travel. <laughs> Life is not fair. Because if those people try that thing again, brought ships to Nigeria, trust me, they wouldn't have enough ships to move people. So they took us by surprise. Now we are ready. They are no longer ready. They are not interested. It's not fair. Anyway, we survived. Um, there's no killing the African. You know, like I said before they came, we had religion. Uh, our ancestors worshipped the traditional way. So those missionaries came and they were baptizing people as they were converting. They'll sprinkle water on you, change your name, and from then on you acquire a new faith. Once in a while, the early missionaries will go around our villages, especially for those of us who come from the southeast of Nigeria, you know, just those days to check how you were doing in the Lord. So on this particular day, Father Philip, an Irish priest, went to the family of Brother Paul, a new convert, to see how they were doing. 
And it was supposed to be a Good Friday. By the doctrine on Good Fridays, you don't eat meat. Those of you who are Catholic, you know. You abstain from meat consumption on Good Fridays. Just, you know, as a way, as a practice of faith. So on that day, Father Philip got to the house of Brother Paul. And behold, he was enjoying his native fufu with bitter leaf soup. With bush meat. <laughs> Father Philip looked into their soup pot, saw the leg of the bush meat, and said to Brother Paul, Brother Paul, are you eating meat on Good Friday? Brother Paul, as a sharp man, said, no, Father. It is not meat, it's fish. <laughs> you can imagine the shock on the white priest's face. When I'm looking, I'm staring at the leg of the bush meat in your soup pot, and you're saying it's fish. So the priest looked at him again and said, Brother Paul, are you going to lie on Good Friday? He said, no, Father, I'm not lying. This is fish, not meat. But let me explain before you get confused. He said, uh, Father, referring to the priest now, you remember when you first came to my community? My name was Amadioha. But one day you brought me out in front of the church, you sprinkled water on me, and you said, Amadioha, from now your name is Paul. And since that day, I've been answering Paul. I went into the farm and I caught this bush meat. But I remembered it was Good Friday and we are not supposed to eat meat. But I need to feed my family. So I took this meat outside, I sprinkled water on it, and I said, Meat, you're now fish. And I told my wife to make soup. And the priest said to him, no, 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 brother Paul, brother Paul, you don't have such powers. Brother Paul said to you, you see where we are going to have problem. If you can change a home here, had to Paul, why can't I change ordinary small this here to fish? Well, baptism is baptism. Yeah, I, I like that our children are beginning to step up, write books. That means the future of Africa is bright. You know, the young woman here, at a very tender age, she's now an author, writing books, planning to write more books. You know, news like that excites me. You know, but I, I also know that for you parents, it's difficult to raise children in this part of the world. You know, because I, I have my own family. My wife and kids live in Canada. And I know how tough it is, how parenting is tough, especially in this century. Because the children are now the new parents. You know, growing up, those of us here who grew up when we grew up, uh, without announcing my age, if you see some of the gray, you can place it. You know, I know it was not easy. We grew up in an era when television was not 24 hours. You don't wake up in the morning, meet TV on, you go to bed, TV is still on. No. TV will start at 4, close at 12. Because the TV station, they will need to rest. <laughs> that was when we grew up. And we didn't know that these things were teaching us patience. You wait for stuff. You don't just get stuff. You wait for it. So by 4 o'clock as a child growing up, you wait patiently for TV. And that was when the head of the house or the head of the family controlled everything. Because once it's 4 o'clock, you go look for your father to come and open the TV. Because he had keys. He came in boxes. So the head of the house will come with the key wherever he is unlock it then slide the doors open you can now watch tv it was, to watch tv was like a ceremony you don't just say every time you press something and tv comes on no you prepare for tv then you sit patiently the national anthem will play pledge will play then you start watching then parental control was not something you set on your decoder or your setup box no parental control was your parents sitting behind and you sitting on the floor. <laughs> if you watch anything you're not supposed to watch, you get a knock. <laughs> and you know, parents don't need to. Not like these days. You will talk and talk and talk. Your parents will only tell you things once. The second one, a knock will accompany it. That one is to engrave it permanently in your memory. So that next time when you hear, you will remember. You know, my father, ah, a soldier at that time, he has no time for you. When you see his face, you correct yourself. <laughs> so parental control was your parents seated on the sofa. Of course, you did not sit on the sofa. Your position was on the floor. 
chairs were reserved for parents, floor for children. Then you sit and you watch. The owner of the house had power over the TV. Now I'm sure most of you don't even know where your remote control is. When you want to watch Junior, who is there? Where is the control? Can I watch my program? You're begging them to move from cartoon to news. So you, even, no, then you don't try it. The remote was you. Your father was the controller. Because it's you. Go and turn on the TV. You go and turn on the TV. Go and increase volume. You go and in, increase volume. I go back and change the chat. You go back. So you were the remote and your father was the controller. It was job. And you will obey. You can't make noise. You will sit patiently and wait. And they will instruct you. So from common sense, you know what not to watch when your father is seated behind you. For instance, anytime I was, we were watching TV, my younger sister and I, if there was a foreign program on, you see a young white male and a young white female discussing. Once they pause and begin to look at each other, <laughs> it's our cue to get out. <laughs> because if by accident you are still there when they lock lips, the slap that will come from my father, you will think you are part of the kissing. <laughs> so as we are watching, once they pause, I'll tell my sister, let us move. <laughs> we'll leave. Because you already know what you're not supposed to see. And you see, some of this training, you know, it, it still stayed with us. Because today, I'm watching TV. My kids are there. Once they begin to kiss, I'm the one who is feeling uncomfortable. And the kids are the ones who are so relaxed. Sometimes they even call your attention to it. Daddy, they are kissing. <laughs> and imagine they hold me. I'm looking for where to hide. You know, but anyways, parents did well and we turned out right. And of course, please a round of applause for all the mothers here, all the mothers. Our mothers did an amazing job. Our mothers, they did a wonderful job, you know, of training us. You know, those were the days when mothers used to give eye signal. If your mother took you to somebody's house, you get the warning first before you leave. No matter what they offer you, you're not hungry. Are you listening? No matter what they serve, no matter how good looking or tasting, you are not hungry. What did I say? Mommy, I'm not hungry. Say good. You're never to accept food from strangers. So when you go out with your mom, you go to maybe a family member's place, and they bring out food. Sometimes these things can look, you know, food from other people's home for a child can look more attractive than your own home food. Because you're tired of every day your mom may probably making the same thing. Then you go to their house, you see the way they are serving. And your, your appetite is being encouraged. Then you establish eye contact with your mom for approval. <laughs> you know, there's a way they look at you and they continue what they're doing. You know that... Uh, you're not part of that meal. <laughs> and if for any reason she sees you walking towards the dining where the food is served, <laughs> when your mom goes like this, <laughs> when she does something like this and looks at you, you know you're finished. <laughs> you know, I don't know how mothers did it. But now, today, you know, most of you here know you can't do that, that eye signal thing with children. They're not even looking at you half the time. Their eyes on their device. You know? I remember one time I got a beating of my life because I went out with my mom and this little kid who just, maybe they just came back, he was talking to the mother in here. Mom, I hate you. I don't like you. Hey! My mother heard. She held my ear like this and pulled me up. You see what in that boy, they tell the mother, any day you talk to me like that, any day you make mistake, any... I was not the one talking, but I was the one getting punished. Any day you talk to me like that, maybe to prove to me that you're grown, I will finish you up. My, of course, my father was, my father those days, my father can slap you for what you're planning to do. You can just be in one corner and my father will come in. What are you doing there? You look like somebody who's trying to do, do. <laughs> but it worked. You know, kids these days, when you talk about it, they think domestic violence. Not be domestic violence. Now I'll bring it. Because the world out there is not going to be kind to you. The world out there is rough. And they are waiting to deal with you. Alright. I also like the fact that um, 
Ike did not forget to give Madame an award. <laughs> that is uncommon wisdom. I like it when men remember to honor their wives. Because, you know, women, they are the most powerful people God created. Is anybody going to doubt that? You know, most times when I say it, men are tempted to argue. Women are the most intelligent of all God creatures. Is anybody in doubt? I know the men are quiet. No, don't take my word for it. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. I'm not going to tell you anything that is not in the Bible. They are the most intelligent. Look, if you go to the book of Genesis, the evidence is there. You know, God set up a garden and planted a tree that brings forth the fruit of knowledge and gave instruction to man not to touch. And Adam, as the fool when him be, did not touch. The tree was there. If you, if you eat this fruit, your eyes will open. Adam is not interested in opening eyes. You see the tree and... Not until Eve came. And um, women in their quest, curiosity for knowledge, became the first to eat out of that fruit. And by so doing, they were the first to open eye. Is it not simple logic? They were the first to know. Because they were full of knowledge. And you know, the funny thing is that there was no time watch calendar at the time. So we don't even know how long Eve enjoyed the fruit before she introduced it to Adam. Her eyes could have been open for like six years and Adam was busy fooling around everywhere. Until one day Eve decided, I can't come, come. Come, Mugu, monkey. Come, 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 let me open your eye. Oh yeah, taste small apple. And it probably wasn't, you know, it didn't digest before God showed up. That is why men have Adam's apple. It was still somewhere here. He had not even swallowed the first piece. So the knowledge had not fully set in. It wasn't fully activated before God came. That was how man became the first of God's creation to fail an exam. You know, the first person to fail an exam wasn't Eve. It was Adam. A simple question of geography, question of location. Adam, Adam, where are you? Simple answer, I'm in the bush. Or I'm in the garden. But instead of giving a geography answer to a geography question, he gave fashion design answer. Adam, Adam, where are you? He said, I'm naked. <laughs> now, what is the relationship between your state of dressing and your location? You know, that was what annoyed God. And God looked at him and said, how can somebody I made in my image be this dumb? <laughs> that was why man was thoroughly punished for an offense that a woman committed. You know? You know, but there's a place, there's, in some areas, we are better than women. When it comes to kindness, we are better. Women, you don't want to argue that one with us. You know, I've given you intelligence that you're smarter than us, which is why it's easier for a 16-year-old girl to chop 60-year-old man money. <laughs> we'll just be giving you, I need, so I need money for, I need money, you'll be supplying, you'll be supplying. And anytime she says thank you, you say, don't mention, don't mention. Don't. <laughs> Meanwhile, your account balance is going down. So intelligence, you score high. But when it comes to kindness, we men, we are kind. Very kind people. So giving. There is no man, unless blood no day your body, there is no man that can say no to a woman. Okay, I know some people are checking now. Okay, let me rephrase. There's no man that can say no to a beautiful woman. Now you're thinking about it. It's possible. Okay, let me see rephrase. There's no man that can say no to a naked woman. <laughs> now you, you have confirmed. That is how giving. You can't. We are so kind like that. And it's also in the Bible. It's also in the Bible. In the beginning as well, God created everything and man and put him in charge. But he was the only one who was alone. Every other person had partner, couple. Then out of pity, God said, let me make you a partner. And the way it was recorded, he put Adam to sleep. And from his side, he took a rib. So we donated in the spirit of giving. <laughs> that we continue to give. He donated his rib. 
and Eve was made. Now flip the script. Imagine that God made Eve first. You know, women, you're not very good at giving. You know, a man can be married to an unemployed woman for six years. You won't hear his voice. But once the man is the one who's unemployed for six months, everybody in the community will know that you are not doing anything. All you do is sit at home and watch TV. So giving is not your natural thing. Women just have to admit it. So now imagine that Eve was the first that God created. Now let me give you a bit about, so that you understand this thing well, let me give you a bit about the biology of women, how they are wired. This region of a woman has too many sensors. Now for those who don't know what sensor is, these are like motion dictators. It has too many sensors. You touch anywhere around here, even if she's sleeping, she will know. Everywhere here around the woman has sensors. If she's sleeping, you come close, she will wake up. That is how they are wired. We, we are sleeping, you can roll us over. We won't know. We'll still be sleeping. That was why it was easy for God to take that rib. But for a woman, she's sleeping. You come anywhere around here or here, she's going to wake up. So now imagine God has made Eve put her to sleep and God goes to take rib around here. As soon as he walks in, Eve will wake up. Then you can visualize the conversation. Ah, God. What are you doing in my room by this time? And God will be like, Eve, sleep, 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 sleep. I want to make you a partner. Hey, God, let me tie my wrapper first. I don't understand. God, if you want to create somebody, is it by touching me around this side? God will say, will you shut up and just sleep? He said, no, 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 God. Have, that's not how you created other things now. You took mud, you molded, and you breathed life into them. How are you now touching me around this? They'll be arguing for another how many years? Only God knows. And we wouldn't have been created. So you now understand how kind we are. Very nice people. So I'll give you... Then when it comes to the most powerful... Of the gender. Of course, women, you are the most powerful. I know some men will like you. You know, that is why in Africa, you know, most times we claim we are the head. We are the head of the family. You know, African men, Nigerian men will like to brag about, I am the head of this family. I am, you, know, you need to know that I'm the head of this family. Yes. The women know. But they are the neck. And the neck controls the head. You know, if you have neck problem, you can't even move the head. The women are so powerful, very powerful. The women, they are the neck. Any man who's married, you know about that. And even more so here. You know, that is why some of us are still back in Africa. Somehow, politically, we have managed to maintain leadership. But here, you guys know you're not in charge. <laughs> you know, one of the first things that surprised me when I came to this part of the world is, you know, how very compliant the men we are. You know, you go to your friends as you see, and they wash plates quietly. They come. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Nigeria, he's a chief. <laughs> and a chief cannot wash plates in Nigeria. Ah, a chief will have like three hours help. Who are you? Chief does not go anywhere near the kitchen. You will stay in your living room, they will serve you. But in this part, <laughs> no, no, you are not heard anything. You will wash plates. Madam will be cooking, you will be doing dishes. I go one of my uncle's house, maybe chief. I see chief. The wife, they say, I raise that plate well low. I shock. <laughs> chief, where will they fear for village? But then they send message to wash plates. You people are very powerful. And you know, it's also in the Bible. It's also in the Bible. Think of any great man that you know in the Bible. When woman show, his powers became questionable. Adam was the greatest in the garden, controlling all the animals. But when Eve showed, you know, power left him. Samson was one of the strongest. Until Delilah cut his head. Power go. Solomon was one of the wisest. You know, in fact, Solomon is one man that I like. One of the kings that I like in the Bible. The way he was described. You know he's a glamorous man. Handsome. 
you know, writer, composer, lover of women. You know, solo. Ah. <laughs> King Solo. Ah, no, 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 no. That man, sometimes I say I visualize him. His greatness, you can't begin to quantify. Solomon, Solomon had 700 wives and cheated on them with 300 concubines. <laughs> Only one person. And this was before the invention of Viagra. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. In fact, if he was still alive, he would be a motivational speaker. <laughs> Organizing conference for men, telling them how to handle women. Because I don't know how Solomon, because that's about, roughly if you do simple mathematics, about 1,000 women. And you're not even up to 1,000 women here. You're not even up to 500 women. So imagine that Solomon, one person controlling all the women here. I don't know how he did it. And you know, a year contains 365 days. So 365 wives. That means the remaining, you know, uh, 600 and will just go untouched in a year. That is why when you look at their dress in that, there's no chance to wear trousers or belt. Now robe. Because at the ratio of one wife per day, no time to remove belts. Is anybody you see, you help her immediately. Because, no, no. I'm trying to censor some things here because of the children. <laughs> you know, so you can imagine the rest. Solomon was that powerful. But when a woman came into his life, Solo's power, King David was the most loved by God. The way it was recorded in the Bible. King David was the most loved. But a woman make him and God quarrel. You know? In the whole of Israel, King David, everybody knows that in the evening, he goes to the balcony to take fresh air. And that was where that woman chose to go and bath. <laughs> for backyard. Knowing that the king would be out there taking fresh air. Then she, she went there to... to, to, to. <laughs> then David, you know? Fair woman, but you know, fair woman for that matter. Not like she's dark, she's fair. Then, you know, having her bath outside. David can't look, see, see the woman. Say, and, you know, men, the way we are wired, some things are involuntary. Some things are, even when you're mad, if you've seen a very mad person, you know, when you're mad to the point that you, you don't run into market, you don't get that, that, then you know that person has so many years' experience in madness. Even when they move, and they see a market woman with leg, they see they go back, check. <laughs> so you can imagine a healthy King David seeing a fool, a woman. Ah, no, no, no. David said, no, no, go, 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 go call that woman. Go and call her. That thing she wants, she will get it. <laughs> so you're very powerful. We can't even begin to question you. You know, we we'll, we we'll love you. You're the best thing. You're the best creature that God, without women in this life, men, you will agree with me, we won't have need to work hard. But if they get up for money and go work, for, when God has put everything in the garden, if there were no women, we would just wake up, climb the nearest mango, eat, hunt antelope, eat, and go back to sleep. <laughs> Maybe play Ludo or what? <laughs> go back to sleep, wake up and eat. All this hustle and acquisition is just so that you can attract the best women. Men wouldn't have bothered to do anything. All these inventions wouldn't have been done if you were not around. The competition is there because you're there. Everybody wants the best, the finest. Uh -huh. So we keep working hard. Any day we want to go another planet, we'll go to sleep. <laughs> and relax. <laughs> we can't kill ourselves. Because a lot of men, you know, statistically back home, there are more widows than widowers. You know that. If you go to church in a typical Nigeria or you know, my village church, you find more widows than widowers. The men are going quick. Because we overwork. We not overwork us. They tell you, oh, you know, the only time your wife agrees you're the head of the family is when there's a bill to pay. Honey, you know you're the head of this house. And these bills are coming up. You have to do something. Then to defend your title as head of house, you keep walking, 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 walking until you pack up. My father has been dead now for 10 years. And now when my mother, they even go abroad, they go places. She's even getting younger, and my father is gone. So I looked at this thing, I said, this head of family thing will not kill me. It will not kill me. After all, there's democracy, rotation of power. So I called my wife one day, I said, honey, you know, I believe in this democracy. 
and power rotation. And we've been married now. It's almost 16 years. And in those number of years I've been in charge, I think it's time for you to take over the leadership <laughs> of the family. Just be the head. Let me just be following your instruction. My wife says, see you. So you want to run from responsibility. I said, no, it's just, you know, let us equality. It is gender equality. I spoke all the English. I said, go, my friend, go, go and do your, take care of your responsibility. So I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm seeing myself as, hey, so at this rate now, who knows, I will go first again. <laughs> you know? And that's one thing about African women. You know, they have a different kind of wisdom. You know, in this part of the world, what is trend here is that you have a problem in your marriage, then you leave. You divorce, you go to the courts, they will grant you 50% of everything you have made together with the man. You know, they split it. Uh, Tiger Woods' wife walked away with so much money. Michael Jordan, you know, the list is endless. These women, they made so much money from getting divorced. But back home is not the trend. Our women are smarter than that. They are not ready to collect 50%. No. They'll just be patient. You will die. They will take 100%. <laughs> because they know you will soon kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> they know your life expectancy is very short. Especially when you are being unfaithful. Ah, you are carrying women outside. They will soon kill you. No problem. You will soon contact something that will end you. The only thing she would do is ban you from coming to her bed so that whatever you contact will just stay with you. You will die of that thing alone. She will stay with her family for where? Stay with the children. Watch. They will just be watching you. Any day you're sick, they will go and check you. <laughs> Once in a while, she will give her children an update. You know your father is sick. You people will be praying for him. Oh. <laughs> a, man, a, man, a man was sick once and was dying in the hospital. So the doctors told the wife, uh, your husband won't be able to make it. His situation is very bad. So as a family, just do your best to make sure he enjoys his last days on earth. You know, don't stress him. So while he was there, he decided to speak. The wife was by his side. Say, honey. <laughs> The wife said, calm down, take water. <laughs> said, leave, leave water. I want to speak. The wife said, shh. They say, you shouldn't talk, just rest. So I want to... <laughs> I need to talk. The wife said, okay, go ahead. <clears throat> you remember, you know that since we've been married, you've always been by my side. The wife said, yes. When I lost my first job, you were by my side. The wife said, yes. <laughs> when I started my first business, you were with me. The day the shop got burnt, you were by my side. The wife said, yes. The day arm robbers attacked us and took my car, you were by my side. The wife said, <laughs> Now that I'm dying, you're still by my side. The wife said yes. He said, come off from my side, you carry bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> Is this any man won't give vote of thanks? I know women don't like that. Okay, let me leave women alone and, and talk about churches. I don't know how you worship here. You know, but church is back home. It's so much fun. You know, you go to church on Sunday, you know that maybe one drama will happen. You know, because there's always drama in church. There's always fun. You know, sometimes it comes in the form of the testimonies that people come to give. I don't know, do, do they do testimonies here in church? Like people come to give testimony. You know, you guys are living the good life, so I don't need testimony. Uh, things are good. You know, back home, testimony. You know, now, nowadays, churches censor it. They, they, they screen the testimony. They, they, they call you, hey, what do you say God do for you? Let us hear. Before you tell the whole church and embarrass us. 
You know, but those days it wasn't like that. I, I, I'll quickly round up. I know I don't have so much time. Those days it wasn't like that. So they would just let people just come and give testimony until, okay, <laughs> thank you. Until one day, a, a church pastor was to, totally embarrassed. The first person came, he was a young girl. Praise the Lord. We say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Our Lord is good. We saw all the time. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, I will not lie. Before, before I be a shower. Hey. This was in church. Now, if you're Nigerian, you know what Ashawo means. Ashawo is prostitute. And this lady was telling us in church, before, before, I be a shower. I don't do a shower, do a shower, do a shower. The pastor was now giving them sign to cut her off, cut her off. <laughs> so they switched off the mic. I said before, before, I don't do a shower for a ketchup. It took the mic by this the mic was off at this point they removed because how do you now you know there are children in church for goodness sake i know some of these kids they are very intelligent they ask too many questions some were already beginning to ask their parents mom what's a shower what's a shower <laughs> how do you now begin to explain to a child what is a shower i know these kids no answer is enough you tell even if you tell them look a, a shower is somebody who says something to somebody for something they, they'll still ask you what is something so there's no need <laughs> <laughs> so they removed the girl. Next, the mother of the girl came. Praise the Hallelujah. This is the way my daughter they talk. This is a shower problem. When it started, we were all surprised. We say, Hey God, how can this spirit of a shower be in our family? She continued, the pastor said, Come. <laughs> so they cut off the microphone again, they moved her out. So they said, allow the young man. So this time a young man came forward. Who praise the Lord with hallelujah. Who praise the Lord with hallelujah. Our Allah, Allah, Allah. The well, Lord is good. We saw the time. <laughs> Just talk. You know you're having difficulty speaking and you're doing all this praise the Lord. The Lord is good. Just go to the point. Say ma, 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 ma. Well, my brothers and who see, who see, who see. Who sisters in the Lord. When I started, oh, 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 oh. Who worshiping in this church? That was in 90. Well, 87. That time, are you? I used to. Who told the who told the I used to stammer where where. I was confused. <laughs> but who won? Who won? Who won? Day? Who my friend? Who, who my friend brought me to this church, and the hope of hope of hope who pastor laid hands on me, and who pray? Who pray? Who pray? Who pray? Who prayed for me? And since that day, I no longer hold. Stop, 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 stop. Ushers just carried him and the microphone and moved him out of the church. What kind of human being is this? At that time, the pastor, the pastor had to come on top of the this thing and said, "No, no, uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, uh, brother, hallelujah, hallelujah, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, I don't know the devil. I don't know what the devil is trying to do in our midst today, but the spirit of God is here." <laughs> The pastor, the pastor had to correct. I didn't, I didn't perform any of those miracles. I don't know them. I don't know where they're from. <laughs> yeah. you know, 
Sounds like this happened. Then a friend of mine said to me, okay, you know this Christmas, we are having harvest in my village. You have to come with me. You know, you've not been to my place. We've been friends. I said, okay, no problem. I'll come with you. Say so we have this harvest. Now, you know, if you're from Nigeria, you know how harvest, harvest service is, especially in the villages during Christmas or festive period. It's, it's a very big event. Harvest is when people actually take their first fruits or whatever they produce and they go to church and they offer, you know, to God. And when the church gathers all those things, they do bazaar sales, proceeds from that, they put back in the, into the development of the church. So we went to their village for harvest. You know, nice service, nice people, happy people, lots of singing and dancing, you know. Now, the drama that played out in that village, there's this young man who was in the business of making coffins, casket. But for a very long time, business was not moving. People were not dying as expected. <laughs> and he had projected and he had made so many coffins, expecting that as usual, but people, I think the standard of living probably improved. So people were not dying like that. And these things were beginning to pile up. So it was harvest. And that morning he talked to his wife. You know, that week he talked to the wife and said, business is not good. Though. And this harvest, we must give something to God. But wait, oh, it's what you produce that you give to God. The wife said, yes. He said, we'll take some of these things that we've been piling up here. We'll go and present it before God. If God does not like the offering, let him change our situation. And it made sense. So for variety, they took two coffins. One small one, one big one. Refurbished it. Repackaged it, redesigned it. And took it to church. Made it look very beautiful. But as they were arriving church on Harvest Sunday, even the ushers and the warden were surprised seeing two people carrying coffin. Say, ah, where are they going? Where are you going to with coffin? It's, today is not for burial. This is harvest. They said, no, we are not here for burial. These things are for harvest offering. He, who gives coffee to God? <laughs> they say, well, this is what we produce. Don't you know us? It's my handwork. What you do is what you bless God with. After all, other carpenters are bringing chairs and furniture. So, ah, they let them in. So, they came into church with their two coffins. And, of course, as they took their position, their people left that session for them. <laughs> <laughs> what do they care? They're used to sleeping amongst those things. So, them and their family, they were there. Service progress, time for offering. People were bringing their produce. Plantain, eggs, oranges, whatever you were producing. People were just piling it up. Choir was singing. The man called him, my man Kechi, let's go. So she carried the smaller one. The husband followed with the big one. They approached the altar of God. The priest saw them from there. He was surprised. Catechist, what is... What is it? We told them all that. But that's what he does. Allow him. He brought it. Now, after service, all items out to the church field for bazaar sales. So they came to me. They say, okay, we know you're an MC. You're going to help us today. You know, auction some of these things. I said, if that is what I would do for God, no problem. So we went outside. People were seated like this. We started with the smaller items, the perishables, crates of eggs. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here today for bazaar auction. Crate of egg, number one, going, any bead, any bead, any bead, any bead. We need 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, going, 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 gone, gone. We sold off all the eggs, all the plantain, baskets, chair. We were just selling stuff. Finally, it was the two coffee swimming. <laughs> I looked to the harvest committee chairman. I say, what do I do? He said, sell it. <laughs> now, how do I market coffee? Well, I said I'll try. Yes, um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have two brand new coffins here today for sale. 2017 model of coffin. We're going to start with the small one. This small coffin, very portable, well designed. The interior well padded, comfortable. You won't feel any stress while you're in it. Any bead, any bead, any bead, any bead from anybody, any bead, any bead, any bead. Everybody went cold on me. I tried for two minutes, no bead. I left the small coffin. I said, because it makes sense. Nobody wants their child to die. So I moved over to the big coffin. At least we have old people. People who are in their 80s and they should be preparing. That was so, so I thought. At least you think that everybody wants to go to heaven. At least some people should be preparing to die. But it's not true. 
So I went to Big Coffin. Big Coffin here. This coffin, man, looking at it, ladies and gentlemen, is more than six feet long, which means no matter your height, you can comfortably fit in. And as you see, this coffin is durable, is strong. You know, there's space. You can even make call inside this coffin in case you change your mind. You know, there's openings for air. You know, if you wake up and you need fresh air, there are holes here that you can... I hype, 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 hype. So any bead for coffin, any bead, any bead, any bead, any bead, anybody? Anybody with the first bead? Nobody. I'm looking into the crowd. I'm seeing old people and they are not responding. I said, these old people here, I don't want anybody be. They say, your father there. I say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so I left the coffin for them. I told her, best committee chairman, I've done my best. He said, leave it. Now, you know, after harvest, whatever is left goes to the priest's house. <laughs> so harvest committee people packed up the coffin and proceeded to the priest's house. The priest was upstairs in his balcony when he saw them coming with two coffins. Say, gate man, lock gate, lock gate, lock gate, lock gate. I won't go lock gate, but lock back. Harvest committee approached the gate and they were knocking. The priest appeared from upstairs. Hey, what can I do for you? They said, oh, father, we are here. We are done with the bazaar sales. We have some items left. Just show us where to keep it in the compound. They say, keep for who? They say, for you now. He say, normally anything that is left will usually bring it here. No, he said, no, I dash harvest committee. <laughs> harvest committee can keep it. Harvest committee says, sir, we are not interested. <laughs> As we speak, that coffin day church road <laughs> belongs to nobody. <laughs> well, that's the reality of life. I guess you guys want to dance, so I won't take much time. Thank you very much. Bless you.